Okay. I think that uh, we are live. Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to this seminar. Okay. Welcome to this seminar on uh, emerging disease. Uh, we, this seminar is um, transmitted from uh, the wildlife, organized by the Wildlife Management uh, and Conservation uh, course um, degree at, uh, uh, from uh, Sassari University. And uh, today we will have uh, as host uh, Professor David Modri uh, which is a, a great scientist, a friend, and uh, comes from the Czech uh, Republic in Brno, uh, where he works in uh, several fields, uh, in particular in uh, infectious disease, in uh, zoonosis, and also in uh, parasitic disease. Uh, also here in um, live, livestock, wildlife, humans interface, therefore, uh, a team which is of great uh, actuality uh, in the One Health uh, concept and paradigm. I will not uh, uh, take more time to David, and uh, please, uh, you can, uh, uh, the students in the room can uh, address a question to David uh, where they want, uh, switch on the microphone and the camera when you wanted to make a question while people which are following us uh, by Facebook Live can write uh, their questions in the comments and uh, I will then address to David. Uh, there is a, a slightly delay between uh, the, la uh, the, the lesson and uh, Facebook and this is uh, the reason why sometimes I look into to different places, but uh, welcome David and uh, good uh, lesson. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for listening. And I'll try to open the PowerPoint again. Uh, can you confirm you see the first slide? Yes. Yeah, okay, super. So uh, thanks once again. And I'm pleased to introduce you a little bit to quite broad topic on the importance of emerging infectious diseases in wildlife. But in many parts of the lecture, I will go a little bit to the theory of emerging infectious diseases and I will take principles also from the livestock and so on, because it's easier sometimes to, to, to explain. Uh, well, um, wait, now it doesn't work, sorry. I'm stuck somehow. My comp now, okay, great. Works, now it works, super. So. Uh, I'm from the Czech Republic, as you heard, which is a little country in Central Europe, not that far from Italy, even though quite far from you. And I'm really pleased that I can give a talk specifically to Italian students because I work quite a lot with colleagues from Bari, Napoli, Padova. I was teaching some courses in Padova. So I really like Italy and I'm happy and sad in the same time, happy that I can give a lecture to Italian colleagues and said that I couldn't be in person in there because of course that would be, would be the best. But anyway, I hope we see each other uh, soon or later. Beside the affiliation to the Czech research institutions, I'm also a director of the Czech Veterinary and Visit Border, with, with, with our Borders, which is a little NGO dealing with the veterinary issues, mainly in the countries of the so-called Global South which also brings me to some of the examples that I'm gonna, gonna to speak about. Within a few, few minutes, I will very briefly introduce roughly what we are doing with my team, even though the team is now scattered through at least three institutions or even four institutions in the Czech Republic, we still work as a team and we uh, work on the several research topics. Some of them relate to our work on, uh, in Africa with, with domestic animals and wildlife, but not exclusively all. So besides this, we have a research projects on the, I can say, eco-epidemiology of parasitic diseases in large herbivores, working both with the domestic herbivores as well as with free ranging ungulates. Very recently or currently, we have quite big projects, ongoing project on the beef cattle on pastures, 
working on mainly on gastrointestinal helminths and the antibiotic resistance. But besides that, we did a lot of research and we continue research on the game animals, so large free-ranging ungulates and their tick-borne diseases, as well as gastrointestinal nem nematodes. Uh, specifically when it relates to, emer to, to the emerging diseases or biological invasions, if you want. I will go to that later. Uh, okay, so this is just an example of, of course, we combine, we try to combine the molecular tools and the, the tools of the routine parasitology, pathology, working with veterinarians in the field, working with, with hunters and so on. And this is one of the outcomes one of the favorite outcomes of our, our research team, which, is, which are the results of the studies on uh, tick-borne pyroplasmids in uh, European deer. And what you see here, an interesting thing is that what you see here in green, called so-called deer clyde, is in fact a new species of Babesia, which is apparently circulating, or which was, uh, and is apparently circulating in European deer population without being noticed because, uh, until, until recently, the molecular tools were not really broadly applied to this animal. So it shows that there is a lot of unanswered questions, even among the European wildlife. We don't need to go to Africa mm -hmm. or South America. Uh, even in Europe, we have a lot of, lot of new things. Besides uh, herbivores, we work with carnivores. Uh, we have a little team working on the wolves, jackals, brown bears. We have a huge collaboration with Slovak Republic. So principally all the samples from brown bears uh, from Slovakia go to, to our team, so we examine, we have access to thousands of uh, fecal, mainly fecal samples of brown bear and wolves from there. This is something, I don't know what it is, doesn't matter. Uh-huh, sorry. So the presentation collapsed because of some reason, so I will try again, sorry for that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I should go back to that. It shows some error occurred. Wait, please. So let me try to open again because something will go wrong. It's always tricky sharing the things. It's okay. Do you see the bird, nice bird? Okay, yes. super. Yes. Perfect. So, uh, a little topic one of my PhD students is working on is toxoplasmosis and avian malaria in endangered tropical birds, which takes us again to the nature con or animal or species conservation, because you might know that the vector-borne diseases in avian hosts, they can have really detrimental impact on their populations. Uh, another PhD student works on the quite interesting disease which we are working on with Italian colleagues, which is so-called testudine intranuclear coccidiosis, which is an emerging coccidium, coccidium which basically killing the land tortoises causing in them disseminated coccidiosis. It probably first, originally it was associated with the African land tortoises, but it seems that at least in captivity, it has a huge potential to spread also to European tortoises. And there is honestly a risk of spillover of this disease to population of European test students. And that can be quite a disaster at least locally. And my probably absolutely favorite topic nowadays, it's emerging nematode Angiostrongylus cantonensis. I will go to that later in the lecture. An impact of this uh, pathogen that is associated with the rats on the fauna of tropical, not only tropical, but mainly tropical islands. And this is also why I like it there, yeah, because if you if you wish to go for a holiday somewhere, go and study and be strong those components because any tropical island you choose is probably highly threatened by invasive rats and this invasive nematode, which is pathogenic to humans. And last but not least, very recently, and this can be interesting for you, uh, uh, we started a project in Somalia, which relates to the conservation and uh, of wild felids, specifically cheetah. We established a voluntary program together with Cheetah Conservation Fund. We established a voluntary program for the veterinary European veterinary students 
that wish to work with endangered uh, carnivores in that difficult environment and the position the volunteering positions are open through year uh, all year round and uh, anytime you wish to go to, anytime you feel you wish to go to Somalia to help to care about confiscated cheetah in, in cheetah shelter please drop me an email and I can directly connect you with cheetah conservation fund and we are very open to any volunteers anytime and in past two years I think there was at least 15 15 maybe 20 European vet students coming with us there and if you tell me today I guarantee you that in three weeks you can fly to Somalia if you wish so please keep it in mind and last but not least the until very recently the major bulk of the projects of my team were the parasites of African great apes at the beginning chimpanzees but lately lowland gorillas and very recently mountain gorillas so we had a three-year project on uh, in uh, Virunga Mountains to monitor the helminth of fauna of uh, go mountain gorillas and impact of helminths on their population. So uh, this is just the field site where we work with apes in Africa. So if I can conclude as a kind of introduction, uh, the project of what we are working on revolves around three basic, basic terms. The emerging infectious diseases is whatever it means. One health, which more relates to, of course, the transmission and common issues between animals and humans, but also to the conservation medicine, which I'm sure you heard about that it's quite fast, uh, fastly <laughs> scientific. <laughs> This switch, okay, okay, super, super. Conservation medicine is very fast uh, and progressively evolving scientific discipline, which kind of connects the medicine as such with the conservation issues, wildlife, endangered wildlife, and so on and so on. And it, this is quite, of course, complex interface. And most of our research deals with the transmission of the pathogens, viral, bacterial, parasitic across this interface. So, but today we speak about mainly about the emerging infectious diseases and about their impact or possible impact on the wildlife uh, and the biodiversity as such. It can be useful to start with the definition of emerging infectious diseases because sometimes it's not really well understood what it is. Uh, I took a definition by American CDCs, which clearly says or simply says that as emerging infectious diseases are classified those infectious diseases that either suddenly appear in a population of animals or humans, or even plants, if you wish, or the diseases with steeply growing importance or geographic occurrence. And so not every important disease can be considered emerging, which is sometimes a misconcept uh, by some people that they tend to, to put the word emerging to any uh, important human and animal pathogens, and it's not the same. Yeah. The, like tuberculosis in many areas of the world, it's not even considered emerging because it was there for a long period of time. The same is malaria. Like when we speak about Africa and malaria, tropical Africa, we can hardly say malaria is emerging because it was there and it is there and so on. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can ask why now? Why the last decades, uh, the emerging infectious diseases term is used so broadly and to be honest in past two years uh, this is a part of this lecture is definitely older no, 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 no. than recent, recent uh, pandemics of coronavirus so it's obvious that emerging infectious disease is something that found its way to, to our daily lives to our daily discussions and so on and question is why and why it is happening now why we are that unlucky generation or why the animals around us are those unlucky generations of animals that are facing the emerging infectious diseases in so huge extent then so is not that straightforward and we have to say that emerging these infectious diseases it's not really new phenomenon if we go back in history probably the first really well documented case of massive 
emerging disease in, in animals is an epidemic of rinderpest in, uh, in African continent. You know that rinderpest is morbidly virus infection that primarily affects the, the bovines and related, related uh, hoofed animals. And it originates from the old world, it originates from the Asian territories. And in 1989, it was accidentally, together with cattle, transported to Africa, which was totally naive, immunologically naive environment, naive continent. And it took 10 years for the pandemic front of the virus or of, of the disease to cross all the African continent, leaving behind tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands that ungulates the domestic animals, the wild animals, and so on. And um, in that time, it was mainly in the, in the reports by British colonial government, we really have the first really you know, scientifically based reports on, on, how, on the impact of such a disease on the animal populations. And it was not only about the, about the livestock, the rinderpest had impact also on the wildlife, it had impact on the carnivores as a secondary effect, and so on and so on. But if you go even more deep into the history, we definitely should mention the introduction of the, of the human pathogens to, uh, to the American continent, to the New World, which is kind of negative and dark, really dark side of so-called conquista, the colonization. Uh, of, of Americas by, by Europeans. So not only, they brought not only the weapons and alcohol or whatever, but they brought with them uh, also a range of diseases that had really in, uh, detrimental impact on the local American, mainly Central and South American population. So the emerging diseases were there, were here always, but still, why is this happening now so much? In the past, it was one disease then and then other disease, but now it's principally happening in parallel hundreds of diseases of animals and, and humans are, are emerging. And the answer can be quite simple. It's a part of the global change and it's one of the most important, even though it was not until recently, it was not perceived as such. It's one of the most important negative phenomena associated with the global change. If you say global change, everyone thinks about the, the, the weather. And we speak about the weather later on also because some of the diseases are associated with the climate. But the recent coronavirus emergence shows clearly that it's not only about the weather, of course. It's not only about the temperature. The new coronavirus spreads easily without any uh, dependence on the, on the warming environment and the climatic aspects of the global change and so on. Yeah? And together with that, there are associated, uh, associated terms like the biological pollution, pathogen pollution sometimes is used. And from that, it's only one step towards the emerging infectious diseases. Yeah? So this is it. This is what we are facing now. This is what we created, I can say. And uh, for sure, the current ongoing coronavirus epidemics is not the last one. That's obvious. But until relatively recently, it was not known that the infectious diseases, they also have really huge and detrimental impact on the wildlife. This is um, my favorite you know, uh, picture from the, it, it's quite old, from the 19th century, showing how the animals are being loaded to the, uh, to the Noah's Ark. But in the same time, we can say that here you see the black hole of the entrance to the, to the boat, but at the same time nowadays the species are disappearing from the planet. So this is that kind of black hole of the, of the extinction. And this is what's happening also on the daily basis or weekly basis of so planet is really losing its biodiversity in enormous speed. And surprisingly for many of us, the infectious diseases, they really contribute to that quite significantly. And this is something I'm trying to touch in this in this talk. Uh, the interest uh, in emerging infectious diseases and the wildlife appeared somewhere at the very beginning of the millennium, probably the first really eye-opening eye -opening study was the review by Peter Deschik and, and his co-workers that appeared in Science in 2000. It's still very valid uh, piece of scientific work. So if you are interested in some overview of uh, the beginnings of understanding of emerging infectious diseases of wildlife. I really suggest downloading this article and going through because it's really, really interesting. 
And anyway, nowadays we know that the emerging infectious diseases are affecting humans, uh, some of them at the local level, some of them at the global level. What's interesting here that if you look to the last line, I already mentioned in the lecture is a few years old, but at least these slides, I already mentioned the, the Middle East coronavirus, but now we can easily adhere to the last line, also the SARS coronavirus 2. Here you see the SARS coronavirus 1. So this is something that was here, and this is something that was really predictable, and hopefully from now we'll be more ready for the diseases that are coming. But if you look to the wildlife, also a huge range of the really different types of the pathogens, different types of the diseases affect, uh, affect either again globally or locally the wildlife. There are just a few examples just showing how broad is the spectrum of the host. We can speak about, for example, diseases of amphibians. I'll speak about later. We speak about the avian, uh, avian infections. We, we can go to the deep sea and discuss the, uh, the infections in the sea turtles, diseases of corals, or we can go to the forest nearby discussing the, the viral diseases of squirrels and, and so on. So the, the list is almost endless nowadays. So uh, it's not easy to classify the emerging infectious diseases and it's, not even, uh, and it's even more difficult to classify the reasons for the emerging infectious diseases, but we can group the causes or the phenomena of, that are contributing to the infectious diseases into four, or at least I tried to group them into four major categories. The first one, and this is definitely the part of the global change, are the changes in the ecosystems. We can speak about the local or global changes, and sorry, there is a typo, which means ecosystems, of course. Yeah, but this is really broad range of the, of the reasons for the diseases. I'll go to that later. Then we can speak about the movement of pathogens as such, either alone or together with their hosts. However, connected to that, we also see uh, the changes in the, uh, of the pathogens as such and the evolution of the new pathogens, for sure. And of course, a related field and related bulk of reasons are also fast evolving methods of the diagnostics. Because nowadays, hundreds of research teams are principally hunting for, for the new pathogens, hunting the new parasites, hunting the viruses and so on. And so there is no surprise that this massively applied novel diagnostic tools lead to the discoveries of massive number of the new parasites, viruses, bacteria, and so on. Yeah. And what's important and was necessary to say at the very beginning that commonly, the reasons for the emerging infectious diseases finally are combined. Yeah. And if you look to the new, to the SARS-2 coronavirus, which is now really something we feel, then we can say that all this principally is involved. Of course, at the beginning, there was this high probability, some alteration of the ecosystem, the unnatural, unnatural contacts between the humans and wildlife in overpopulated Asia. Where, where the wild, wildlife is commonly part of the human diet in massively growing amount and so on. So this is still kind of, it's part of the ecology of the, of the animals and, uh, and humans locally, even though we don't know exactly the source, it's coming from there. And then of course the movement, it's all about the movement. You know how fast the new pathogen moved because of massive movement of the people on the planet. So again, this is significant obvious part of the global change. And nowadays we speak almost daily about the new variants, uh, mutations and types of the, of the sars coronavirus 2 So we see in our own eyes how fast the evolution of the new pathogens can be and the resulting and changes in the resulting diseases. And of course, this is also connected to the novel methods of the diagnostics and the awareness. So I, I promise I'm not going to speak about uh, new coronavirus again, probably, but uh, this is really a nice example to show that it's not easy to say or to separate individual reasons of emerging infectious diseases, neither in humans nor in the animals. This chart is showing uh, major reasons of the biodiversity loss. You know, you know that the, the, the planet as such or the biosphere as such is really facing the enormous loss of the, of the biodiversity. And these are the major, major reasons. This is the loss of the habitats for sure. 
this is the climate change, definitely. This is the pollution still, even though this is uh, uh, getting better in many areas of the world. And then we have two categories which are here divided, which are the diseases and the invasive species. But for me, it's very difficult to difficult to divide these two categories because the new pathogens or the emerging pathogens which are causing those new diseases are again nothing more nothing less than the invasive species so from this perspective the emerging infectious diseases is just a part of a biology of invasive species or it's a part of phenomenon of the biological invasions and these invasions can happen either at the geographical scale so from place a to the place b but they can happen also ecologically. And this is what I, something I'm going to show you in one of the next, next examples. And when the pathogens are, are principally invading the new relationships within the ecosystems, which is invasion as well, even though it's not that much geographic, it's more ecological invasion connected to the food webs uh, in the ecosystems. Yeah. So let's look for a few examples uh, from the first category. I'll go sometimes quite fast because I really wish to end in some realistic time. Let's look to the diseases which are caused by the ecosystem alterations or the changes. We can speak about the global changes. I'm not going to go in detail into that because there was a lot of said already about the climate change and the resulting changes. But what's more interesting, at least on, from my perspective, are the local changes or the local ecosystem alterations. Because principally, and it's not surprising for you probably, any change in the ecosystem, of course, leads to the changes in the relationships within the ecosystem. And logically, it leads to the changes in the transmission of the pathogens in the life cycles of the, of the parasites and so on and so on. So it's not only like the negative, like if we, when we say alteration, we kind of have perception of something negative. But here we should also consider, consider that any uh, changes of the habitats, including the improvement, kind of, from our anthropogenic perspective, the improvement of the habitat can have impact on the transmission of diseases, yeah. including the nature conservation, including of creating the green zones in the cities, attracting the animals and the disease vectors to the cities because of the improvement of the, of the environment and so on. Yeah, so uh, it's the basic rule of the ecology, it's very difficult to say what is, in, what is for good and what is for bad. Any change can start cascade effect of uh, that includes the transmission of the diseases. Yeah. Going through the changes in the ecology of vectors, changes in the demography, which is really important, or ecology of the host, changes in the food chains and food webs, I'll show you examples, but also, I mean, those negative uh, ways of alteration of the environment also can contribute to the pathogen pollution and so on, like, for example, with the products from the, from the meat factories and so on locally. And if you look to the examples of such diseases, there are really many. Lyme disease, uh, mycoplasma conjunctivitis in birds, trichomonosis in birds, helminthosis, and so on. I will go to that, to some of the detail, in detail. One of my favorite examples of showing how tricky it is to manage the populations of wildlife or to interact with the wildlife without interrupting or without, uh, without uh, changing the pattern of the disease transmission is case of trichomonosis. And it's not only in the British Isles, it's all, I can say probably it's true for most of the, most of the temperate Europe. You know that nowadays, like to support the populations of the birds in the cities, to support the populations in the environment close to human settlements, uh, all around the, at least Europe, people tend to provide the food for the birds in winter. And of course, if you look at that from the more or less ethical perspective, it's nice. And also I like it and my kids, they like it feeding the birds. You create a small wooden house, you put the, you put the food and from your frozen window, you see how hundreds of birds are coming, eating happily and so on and so on. But what was documented in uh, a few studies is that creating this artificial, artificially creating high densities of the birds on the feeding places uh, contribute to the easy spread of the pathogens, including uh, trichomonads, which finally results in the more mortalities and local population decline of the sensitive species. And it's for me, this is really important 
important kind of example, an important message showing that it's really not easy to interfere or to interact with the nature. And sometimes we really feel that we are doing something for good. And finally, the neg resulting negative effect can be, can be quite huge. Okay, fine. So let's move to some other example. So I, honestly, I am not working with trichomonosis in, uh, in birds. So it was the example from the scientific. Uh, scientific papers. But what we are doing, as I mentioned, we work with the uh, helmets in mountain gorillas. And for me, it really opened another serious question, and it is how much we can increase the populations of endangered animals in some localities without having impact or without impacting on the disease transmission pattern. Uh, you know that the mountain gorillas, it's one of the most endangered, uh, in the, or not most, but it's one of the really endangered large mammals, specifically in the history. But in the recent years, thanks to strong conservation efforts and thanks to intense, really intensive veterinary management, the population is growing relatively fast, now reaching more than 1,000 individuals, which are being spread into two populations, Virunga Mountains and um, Vinde Impenetrable Forest uh, at the border between Congo, Rwanda, and, and Uganda. Yeah. And we were invited, in, uh, invited like four years ago to take part on the conservation of mountain gorillas and to answer the questions if the growing mortality that was observed in that time in, the, in groups uh, of mountain gorillas in, in Rwanda is somehow connected to the, uh, to the parasites or, or not. Because so quite ambitious and huge network involving the institutions in several continents was established. My team did mainly the field work and some molecular parts, uh, parts of the research and coordination. And what was the, obvious evidence on site that when you do the necropsies of dead gorillas, you really see quite, uh, quite a lot of different helmets. This is the necropsy of one of the males, and you see the numerous uh, Anoplocephala gorillae, the specific tape form of gorillas, but uh, also the numbers of the strongylate and related nematode seems to be growing in both subpopulations of the uh, of the mountain gorilla general population. Yeah, so it opened a lot of this kind of situation that seems to be really changing or something new in the mountain gorilla population. It, it opened quite a lot of important questions. Some of them are more scientific. Some of them can be more like even philosophic. The first thing is, do we see really changes in the transmission ecology or in the transmission pattern for those parasites or, or what other reason we can uh, imagine behind the obvious increase of the of the parasite uh, abundance? So that was really a scientific question. But then we go further, and we are opening more the questions about the management. Okay, if we if we see that the gorillas are really suffering from from helminthosis, shall we react somehow? And for me, this is already a tricky question because we are dealing with the animals living in the national park. We are dealing with the animals which are supposed to live without that much interfering with the humans. And suddenly, if we start deworming them regularly, principally we are turning the national park to a gorilla farm, at least from my perspective. Yeah. And the question is, is this something we want? Uh, and of course, there is one other question which emerged behind that. I'll, I'll go to the later now, a few pictures. So uh, two dominant parts of the, in the gorillas, strongylates, principally identical morphologically to the, at least in the microscopes, to the strongylate of equines. In general, the parasitofauna of mountain gorillas, it's very similar to, the, to that of, uh, of horses. And the, sec uh, the second type are the, of parasites are the plague worms. And what we know that all this, all this, uh, parasites, they have the environmental stages, so they are not transmitted directly between the gorillas. They are transmitted through the stages in the environment. Those are either the larvae or the infected or ibatid mites in case of, uh, in case of uh, tapeworms. But we can conclude that logically, 
because this is principally the environmental contamination which stays behind the loads of the parasites that we see in the gorillas. This should be density dependent, such a transmission, which, or, which really opens the questions. Isn't it possible that the growing numbers of the parasites that we see in individual mountain gorillas are resulting from growing population trends, which are obvious? And it opens then another more ecological question or important question for the conservation biologists. Okay, what's the sustainability of the ecosystems? Yeah. Are we already reaching the upper limit of the gorilla density that can be that can be reached in relatively small mountains like, like the Virunga, Virunga and Vindi are? Mountain gorillas are huge herbivores. And we already have 1,000 of them in a relatively, relatively small, small scale or small geographic range. If you look to the same situation in a sheep or a horse, it's obvious that smaller your fenced area is, bigger uh, and more uh, or higher the density of the animals in your farm, of course, larger the contamination of the environment and higher risk of the transmission. And finally, in your sheep or horses, you see really steeply growing uh, numbers of the or abundances of the worms. And question is, is this the same what we see in gorillas? I couldn't give you exactly the answer because we are still in the middle of middle of the research. But what we started with my colleagues, Jan Slapeta from Australia, Barbara from my team, we really started to uh, look at the quantitative aspects. First time in the history, we looked a little bit more closely closely to the quantitative aspect of the, of the gorilla parasites. Here you see the situation in the individual groups. The letters A, B, C, D, blah, 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 are the individual groups of gorillas. And uh, you see the, the results of the detection of the strongylate X and results of counting of the X per gram of the feces. And what was what's really surprising here that we divided kind of at the very beginning kind of primitive empirical way, the population of mountain gorillas to the gorillas from the areas with the low density of the gorilla population, and which are the blue groups of gorillas. And then we took the groups that we consider as gorillas living in the, popu in the population with high density of gorillas per square kilometer or whatever. And the results of the first round of the examinations, now with more statistical approaches, we see that it's not that straightforward like the, in this original picture. But we see two things. First thing is that there is a huge difference between those, even though it was kind of empirical uh, division between these, these groups, the difference in the load of the nematodes was really enormous. So this is first thing. And second thing is, which relates more to the management of the infection is that even within a single gorilla group, like this one or this one or this one, doesn't matter. It's a huge range of the, of the values. So apparently we see in many groups, we see the individuals which can be classified as so-called super, super shedders. And what we are now trying to answer is the question, who are these gorillas? And are these the males, females, adults, babies, and so on? And the second question, okay, why it is like this? And then if we want to do any management, of the parasitic infections is the Probably we have to target this uh, upper part of the of the groups, like only the animals which show, which shed a lot of the eggs. So that was the example of gorillas showing that even the nature conservation and the growing densities of the of the host can really have impact on the on the transmission of pathogens. And then vice versa, of course, these pathogens logically have impact on the on the population of the host. It's not that surprising. One of the, now we go back to the textbook examples. And uh, I, sh I use ex examples from the sea orders and their populations of the southern sea orders close to, close to or living on the west, uh, western shore of United States. You probably again know that if you are interested in wildlife, so you must know that the southern population of sea otter and hydralotris uh, Nereis is really endangered large uh, carnivores, uh, carnivores mammal living in the uh, in the ocean, and because it's in the United States, the population were really protected since the half of previous century, and they were quite promisingly growing. However, starting from 1990, 
1990, people observed also growing number of the of the mortalities, and already in the 90s, the studies were published analyzing the causes of mortality in the sea horrors. This is from one of the first studies which was done by people from UC Davis and their collaborators in, in, in US. And you see that the infectious diseases, and this is the mortality of basically of the adult sea otters that were found on the beaches as that. And you see that the infectious diseases really contribute significantly to, to the fact that the sea otters are, that the adult sea otters are dying. And uh, four major pathogens that can be uh, easily divided into two groups were divided. The first group are heteroxenose coccidia, toxoplasma and sarcocystis neurona. Second group are the acanthocephalons, helmets of the digestive system, which is this picture in the lower right corner. Uh, if you divide, these parasites really deserves division because they are totally different. Yeah. If you look to those heteroxenos, heteroxenos coccidia, it's quite surprising. And from the beginning, it was surprising because how, how it comes that the parasites, which are typical for the terrestrial ecosystems, cycling between the vertebrates and the terrestrial ecosystems are suddenly significantly affecting the population of the sea mammals or, or animals living in the, uh, in the sea ecosystems. And I don't think that we need to go to in detail to the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii. So from the almost very beginning, it was obvious that if there is something that can be responsible for the infections in the sea otters, this must be the osses from, uh, from the cats that are shed in the, in the feces and later contaminating, the massively contaminating the sea, uh, sea water. And that was proven and in several studies demonstrated that uh, really the osses of Toxoplasma gondii are massively, nowadays massively entering the, uh, the sea waters and infecting the range of the aquatic animals, not only the sea waters, but also the others. Yeah. Okay, so this is it. And if you look to the second parasite, it's even more interesting. Sarcocystis neurona, you know that it's a, again, I, I hope you know that it's a parasite. It's heterotoxin scorcidus cycles um, uh, using the possum, the North American possum as a definitive host and a range of the range of the terrestrial vertebrates as intermediate hosts. And again, the question is how it is, how it comes that it's finally finding its way to the brains and to the organs of the sea others. And the uh, answer here is, the principle is the same. It's the contamination of the water with the osseous or sporocysts in this case, and uh, direct contact of the sea otters with the pathogens. Here it is even more uh, interesting uh, because you probably know, or you possibly uh, probably know, you probably don't know. I wanted to say that the population of the possum is distributed in the Northern America into two parts. The first, the larger range goes from Central and South, from Central America along the Eastern coast of the United States. And this is the native range of possum. However, during the colonization of the Wild West by European settlers, the possum was brought to the Western, Western coast of the United States. And this is area where the sea otters are living. Yeah. So basically here we see two, two phenomena uh, coming together. It's the geographical invasion of the, and we are back to our invasions. First, it's a geographic invasion yeah. um, facilitated by humans, where carnivore, relatively invasive, or carnivore for po this invasive potential was transported across the mountains and the long distances to the suitable habitats in the east, uh, sorry, west of the United States. So it's geographical invasion. And immediately after principally, it's an ecological invasion because it suddenly, because of ecological changes and the contamination of the water, it suddenly invades into the populations of totally new and immunologically naive and unprepared hosts. And the same is nowadays happening globally, worldwide, with a range of different sea mammals. So toxoplasmosis is really an emerging disease in, uh, 
in the seals, in the sea lions, in the dolphins, including the Mediterranean, as you probably know, and so on. One of the most extreme examples are the beluga whales. You know that these nice and charismatic uh, cetaceans are distributed along, or oh, sorry, uh, around the Northern Pole. And even in these localities, in the really remote localities, the beluga, beluga whales suffer the mortalities resulting from toxoplasma gondii, or at least toxoplasma gondii stages can be detected in their tissues in case of dead animals. The same way I took also some, uh, some headlines from the, from the internet or the National Geographic and so on, you see that the, the toxoplasma gondii is believed to be responsible for for the, Hawaii, for the mortality among the Hawaii seals and so on. So this is happening repeatedly at principle at the global scale. Let's go back to the sea otters and the second group of the helmets, which is even more interesting, and those are the acanthocephalans. Yeah. There, is a, there, are, there is a lot of reports really documenting that the acanthocephalans are causing the severe pathologies in the sea otters, which is not that surprising, you know, acanthocephalans, these are the worms, which are able really to penetrate deeply into the intestinal mucosa, finally able to even to perforate the intestinal mucosa, which leads to the sepsis and acute, uh, acute diseases in the hosts. And question is, again, how it relates to the biology of the sea orders. Principally, the acanthocephalans, uh, which, are, uh, which are detected in the sea orders, they normally cycle among the birds, and the crustaceans, which are called sea crabs, which are crustaceans inhabiting or very abundant on the, on the sandy areas on the beaches uh, of the California, uh, on the Californian, uh, Californian coast. So the question now is, and I cannot say that it was answered perfectly, it can be only hypothesized, what changed in the ecosystem that suddenly the sea orders are becoming infected and entering the life cycle of, of, of these parasites. And we can only hypothesize, but in some of the studies published, published in the past, it was documented that the sand crabs, the intermediate hosts of the, of the acanthocephalans, are preferred mainly by the juveniles and females, which are of the sealers, which are supposed to be the categories with the highest demand for the energy. And it was also hypothesized that there is a recent probably a recent food shift in the preferred food or in the food preferred by the sea, sea otters, which can be one of the outcomes of the general depletion of the, of the biodiversity of the offer of the, of the ocean. So basically the sea otters, they, they have nothing to eat or they, they do not have enough of other food. So they have to switch to alternative source of the energy, which was not eaten in the past. And these are the sand crabs, which are full of the larval stages of the acanthocephalons, which originates from the birds. So it's still hypothetic. It's very difficult to prove, but it's a picture which doesn't give that much hope, to be honest. And this is one of the, this is what I mentioned in the beginning, in the introduction. This is one of the most severe consequences of the, of the ecological changes when the parasites are entering the new relationships between the animals and when the new trophic relationships are emerging and the parasites are invading them because principally the sea they cannot escape. And us as humans, we can hardly interfere with the situation because we cannot feed the sea otters in the sea. And the same way we can hardly, hardly uh, manage the populations of the sea crabs or the populations of the birds or the parasites in there. So again, it's a principally a question: Was this an invasion in the geographic meaning, or is it invasion into the into the new uh, new ecosystem, which is, or more or less, it was an invasion to the new trophic relationship between the sea otters and the, the sand crabs. I'll show you a very similar example just to show that it's not happening only, only to Americans and so on, but I'll show you also a similar example, even though not, even not that, 
not that obvious or not that spectacular. But I show you the example from the Eastern Romania, where we started together with my Romanian colleagues and Swedish colleagues, a research on the mortalities of the dice snakes. The dice snake, it's a colubrid snake, which feeds on the fish. It's common or locally common all across the Europe. And it used to be common also on the localities close to the Black Sea with the brackish water on the shore of the Black Sea. There are some brackish lakes. But what, uh, there was a project for the snake that we participated in, and what was interesting or puzzling at the beginning was that uh, we did a lot of nice field research in there with my colleagues. But what was puzzling is, or interesting was that the snakes are dying with quite enigmatic lesions on their bodies. This is uh, an adult dye snake, and you see, you see here really a lot of lot of weird swellings on the body. If you look to the same snake or similar snake, not the same. Uh, when it is dead, you see really swollen middle part of the body is with a lot of uh, partial swellings and you see the same. And at the necropsy, it took us only a very short time to discover that all these changes are caused by huge larval nematodes. And if you, if you look deep in more detail into the pathology, you see that they are causing really enormous pathologies to the snakes. This is a dorsal part of the snake after skinning, uh, skinning its skin. And all these are the lesions, the granulomas and the lesions either containing the coiled nematodes or containing just the, uh, representing only the inflammatory reaction after the migration of the nematodes. And it was not that difficult to determine the parasite. And we discovered that, in fact, these are the lesions caused by Ostrongelides which are the nematodes which normally cycle in totally different life cycle, cycling between the birds and the fish. Then we started to examine the fish in the same locality and we found that a particular group of the fish, the family Gobida, the gobits, are really full of the, of the Astrogelides larvae. And in the same time, we also proven that they represent a dominant, at the given locality, they represent a dominant part of the diet of the dice snake. Then we examined the cormorants, which are dominant birds, and not surprisingly, we found the worm in there. So it was not that difficult uh, to finalize the picture when the parasite is cycling between the cormorants and the, and the gobbit fish, with including of the oligoheads as the first intermediate holes. But then, dice snakes are entering the life cycle as totally aberrant, unnatural host. And what's happening is that the last stage larvae of, of Eustrongylides are massively migrating through their bodies, principally from the area of stomach, but because after the fish is swollen, those huge larvae are emerging from the fish, perforating the intestine and finding its way to different parts of the, of the abdominal cavity and the body of the dye snake. Again, we can only hypothesize why this is happening. What we know nowadays is that the gobbit fish are dominant prey uh, items on the given places. And it also suggests a recent food shift from the, from the fish species that used to be abundant in the past and are nowadays replaced by the gobbits, which can be also a result of the eutrophization of the water and so on and so on. And finally, it leads to the population decline of a studied host, in this case of a snake on the, in the given, given geographic area, which Basically, it's, at least for me, the same example as the example of the sea otters. And when we speak about the ecological changes, we can go a little bit to the bad transmitted diseases, just to refresh a little bit your memories about the diseases which are associated with the bats. And there is, I recommend you a really nice article by Kuzmin and co-workers, which is summarizing relatively recently the reasons for the emergence of the bad diseases. And you know that the diseases associated with chiropterans are quite many, including, possibly including the new SARS uh, coronavirus. Yeah. These are just, again, like few examples that it's not only the coronavirus that is associated with the bats, but those are, those are also other viruses like a Nipah virus, which uh, very recently created issues in, uh, in India, for example. And what's interesting, if we go to, again, to a kind of connection with the SARS coronavirus 2 and the Nipah virus, there, uh, I read some reports saying that the impact of the coronavirus in southern India 
was not, not that huge because the population of the humans was already prepared, or I can even say trained, because the previous epidemics of the Nipah virus that occurred just in 2018. So, which shows that we can learn how to, this is from 2018 nowadays, you see the same, the same situations on the streets of entire world. So we can learn how to deal with the pathogens, which is optimistic. If we go to the interesting from the perspective of the wildlife and the reservoirs to the interesting uh, interesting viruses associated with bats, we definitely should mention Hanipa viruses. Hanipa viruses stands for, it's abbreviation from the names of the two main viruses, Hendra virus, Nipah virus. I, I know that, uh, so I'm sure that you know this from virology. And Hendra was the first one discovered. It was discovered in Australia where the surprising mortalities among the horses were immediately afterwards associated with the mortalities in people that were taking care about the sick horses. And it took a very short period of time to discover that what stays behind are the fruit bats, which are the reservoir of the virus to, for human population. And a few years later, at the end of 90s, uh, previous, uh, of the previous century, similar but larger epidemics appeared in, uh, in Malaysia or in Southeast Asia. Uh, being uh, for which was the new virus described uh, being responsible for that was a Nipah virus and uh, is the same that emerged in, in uh, India very recently. In both cases, these viruses are associated with the fruit bats and the spillover of the virus from the fruit bat population to the livestock or to the humans is connected, um, usually connected with the ecological changes and increased contact between the wildlife and, and uh, the domestic animals and humans. In case of fruit bats, it's specifically in Asia, it's one of the reasons is that we are, or people are destroying the natural habitats of the fruit bats. And in the same time, creating perfect artificial habitats nearby the human settlements by farming uh, or planting the mango uh, or opening new and new mango farms. So we are attracting the hosts, or people are attracting the hosts of these viruses to live closer to them. So not surprising, not, not surprised that the viruses are then spilling over to the populations of the domestic animals and so on. Interesting other questions, why bats are so commonly associated with the new diseases? And one of the answers is, is in their diversity. Yeah. For most of the people, it's really, surprising to read or hear that the bats are one of the most diverse or the second most diversified group of mammals. So there is more than 1200 species of different bats, which accounts for more than 25% of the diversity of mammals. So we cannot be surprised that so many viruses or so many pathogens are originating from this group of mammals because they are so numerous. And in the same time, they are highly mobile, they are very social, they commonly live close to humans and they react very fast to habitat changes, which takes us best to the ecology. Yeah? If we do a, take us back, if we do a, some impact on the ecosystems, which to, if I simplify that the bats or fruit bats do not like, they have the wings, so they fly, they fly away and they find other places to, to live. And this is how the pathogens are moving together with them. Okay, so that was the first category of the ecosystem alteration. Now let's look more closely to the direct movement of the pathogens, which is much easier to imagine uh, or to describe. Because if we move, if something moves from the point A to the point B, and we are able to track this movement, it's not that surprising or not that spectacular. But in this case, it directly relates to the, to the theory and praxis of the biological invasions. And the Pathogens are a significant part of the, of the, of the invasive, invasive organisms. If you look to the biological invasion from a little bit more theoretical perspective, every invasion, it has two, two steps. The first, sorry, uh, the first is the geographic one, when the hypothetic pathogen here on the drawing of my daughter uh, or alien, alien species has to find its way to a new place in this case, to hypothetic island. This is that really movement pattern or movement part. But then we have other, other part or the second phase where the pathogen or the alien organism has to establish itself in the, in the new 
new ecosystems, which is already definitely more ecological than physical aspect of the, of the movement. And if you look to the parasites, this directly linked to other phenomenon, and it's also it's phenomenon of the host specificity. Because even invasion of a new host, which means break, or we can say breaking the borders between the natural and new unnatural holes, is nothing more, nothing less than other invasion. And it also has two parts. The first one, or the first filter that kind of determines the host specificity of the pathogens, it's so-called encounter filter, which means that the parasite should find physically the new host. I'll show you examples. And then the same way as in the previous chart, we have the other, uh, the other barrier, which tends to prevent the changes of the hosts. And it's so-called compatibility filter, which means that the new parasite should find, or new pathogen should find some compatibility with the new host. And you know, from the discussion about the uh, new coronavirus, that's in case of viruses, we already know it's about the compatibility of the molecules, the receptors, and, and so on and so on. In case of complex organisms like the helminths or protozoans and so on, this is definitely more, more difficult. And once these two filters are kind of broken, then the, the invasion and the finding new holes can happen with all the consequences. And if we speak about the invasion of the parasites into the new systems, of course, we have to distinguish also between the monoxenos and the heteroxenos parasites. Because in monoxenos, it's more or less just the physical movement and finding a new host. But in case of heteroxenos parasite, the invasion has also the, the, the part of the definitive and the intermediate host. And if the pathogen is to invade a new system, either the pathogen should come with the both types of the hosts or should find another alternative, for example, intermediate host in the new ecosystem. And I'll show you in a few examples that this is really happening. You can skip. If you want to demonstrate a really long distance dispersal of a new disease that is associated with the parasites and the vectors and so on, one of the nice examples is the invasion of West Nile fever to the United States, which happened in 1999. I'm quite old, so I remember it from the news. I remember uh, the first news about the dead birds in the, in the city parks in, uh, in the east of the United States. But I want to show you how fast such an invasion is. Yeah? So this is year 2000, 2001, 2002. And why it was so fast? Because, as you know, the hosts of the, the, the reservoir hosts of the West Nile virus are free engine birds, which are extremely mobile hosts as such. And the vectors, is, uh, the, the spectrum of vectors involves a lot of a lot of mos mosquito or several mosquito species, which are again broadly, broadly distributed in the, in the ecosystems, which enabled within a four years, principally the virus to colonize such an enormous territory as the United States are. And of course, and it's permanent colonization. Okay. If you look to the ability of invasions among the pathogens, definitely it's highest in the viruses and highest in the directly transmitted viruses. It's not surprising, and again, the new coronavirus are giving us nice lesson of that. But if you look to the wildlife and the viruses, quite a lot of pathogens are among the mammalian mobile viruses, including the rinderpes we spoke about already, canine distemper virus, a range of mobile viruses in sea mammals, measles in apes, and very recently also PPR, which stands for the pest, the petit ruminant, the important disease of small livestock, which you probably know. And if we speak about the canine distemper, apparently we have to mention, and it's also part of the part of the entire entire story of biological invasions and impact on the wildlife. We have to mention the domestic dogs. Uh, I'll give you a question. So now, please try to answer at least some of you. Uh, do you have any idea how many dogs are living, the domestic dogs are living on the planet? Try to guess. Hmm? Please. 
just to show that you are there. <laughs> <laughs> Try to guess how many dogs are living on the planet. Just domestic dogs or no villages dogs or? No, oh, this are oh, yeah, like the, the domestic dog, like biologically, I mean the dog. Oh, well, billion of them? I have no idea, a lot. Okay, yes, that's correct answer, a lot. Can you try to specify what a lot means in this case? If you have small garden, even 10 dogs is a lot. So Millions. be a little bit more specific, what a lot means. I used to have two dogs. And I can say that that was a lot. It was too much. But how many? How many dogs? I'm are guessing uh, millions. Millions? You don't think? No. Go higher. Go higher. It cannot be millions. Just imagine how many people are here. Yeah? No. Just to make it shorter, it's about one billion. There is roughly one billion of dogs on the planet. Which is not that surprising, considering that there are seven billions of people. So this is common ratio between the human and dog population locally. It's like one dog per five to ten people. I think in Italy it's similar. Yeah. So this is uh, first thing. But what's important if we speak about the diseases? Can you can you guess how many of these dogs are so-called free roaming? Which means they are not fully controlled by the owners. They are moving around. They are living in the villages. They are living on the streets and so on. How many of these one billion of dogs? More than 60%, yeah, like the majority. 80, they say 80%. Mm -hmm. So it means that we have on the planet 800 million dogs, which are not really receiving a, a veterinary control and are of course, source of the diseases. So the successful co-evolution co or uh, living together with the humans made the dog the most uh, the, the most widespread and dominant predator on the planet, which has the direct impact on the of, on the wild carnivores. But the diseases resulting from the from the domestic dogs has also a huge impact on the populations of the sea mammals. Now I speak about canine distemper. Sea mammals like the sea lions and, and the seals mainly. Wild carnivores mainly in Africa, but not only there. Uh, I mean, wild canine carnivores, but also surprisingly, the canine distemper virus is transmissible to lions and is responsible for some population declines of lions in, in Africa and so on. And the same way, uh, the dog in most of the ecosystems nowadays is related to, or it's responsible for the spillover of rabies to the populations of wild animals in Africa which might be a bit surprising, uh, like that uh, Africa as such is full of native free-ranging carnivores, but still was responsible for the, for the maintenance of the transmission cycle of rabies are not free carnivore, free living carnivores as such, but those are the domestic dogs, which gives us at least some hope, at least because like, thanks to the advancement or advances in the veterinary medicine, we are nowadays perfectly able to control the diseases of the domestic dogs because the companies invested so huge money and the scientists invested so huge effort that we have powerful tools. The only thing is that we have to, or we must imply them or uh, employ them and, and control the diseases of the dogs. And this is what's happening, for example, in Africa, in many places. And probably the, the oldest project that aims at the vaccination of the domestic dogs in the vicinity of uh, conservation areas is the Afia Serengeti project, which principally aims at creating a circle of the vaccinated dogs all around the Serengeti, the complex, uh, Serengeti complex, uh, which is one of the largest African national parks. And thanks to, I think, 20 years of the history of the project, maybe more, there is already a really growing amount of the, of the experiences that, yes, yeah, so question is, yes, we can, as somebody said in the US, and we are really able to, to, to control disease. I'll give you one of these examples later on again. Yeah. And if we, if we speak about the surprising emergence of the diseases in wildlife and the morbidly viruses, we definitely should mention the mortality of saiga antelopes in Mongolia. Yeah. You probably know, because you are interested in wildlife, that the saiga antelopes are really kind of 
iconic animals or charismatic herbivores of the Central Asian steppes and semi-deserts. And then they used to live there in, in millions and millions, being a dominant herbivore in the area. And they are, of course, endangered as basically almost all wild animals. But they were successfully protected in the range of national parks. And what happened in past decade, first in 2015 by pastoralosis, and second by PPR in Mongolia in 2017, that within, we can say within five years, we lost 80% of the, of the saiga antelopes. And in both cases, probably it's the livestock which stays behind as a, as a source of the infection. And considering, considering the importance of saiga in these ecosystems, one should ask also what would be the consequences of disappearance of saiga because of those two, two viruses, two, sorry, two diseases caused by relatively common pathogens. Yeah. And the consequences can be quite detrimental. And if we really continue or if, if decrease or decline of the populations of wild herbivores continues this speed because of the pathogens, we can sooner or later lose also the majority of large carnivores, which are highly protected area, uh, animals in those areas, because they have nothing to eat. Or if the wild herbivores disappear, of course, it escalates immediately the wildlife livestock conflict because these free ranging carnivores have to eat something and they will probably be in more contact with the herds of domestic domestic ungulates, creating or increase uh, creating increased tension or increasing the uh, or multiplying the tension, which is anyway there between the pastoralists and the free free ranging free ranging carnivores. Yeah. So it's quite sad or alarming situation. For me, quite interesting aspect of this is that, and it really goes to one health that Antonio mentioned in the beginning, and I also mentioned in the beginning. That if we want to solve whatever we want to deal with the diseases, we have to consider we have to consider the livestock and the wildlife together. And as a result of uh, as a result of epidemics of PPR uh, PPR in Mongolia, there was a conference organized by FAO and the major dominant conservation organizations, which was in Rome two years ago, and I had a chance to participate on that. And it was probably one of the first occasions in the history where people from such different fields like FAO, IUCN, and Wildlife Conservation Society and so on met together to see what can we do to minimize the impact of the emerging diseases on the wildlife. So it's not only about the livestock. PPR is important disease of the livestock, of course, but it has the impact on the wildlife. And vice versa, you probably know that FAO also announced years ago, a global campaign for the eradication of the PPR and billions of dollars are spent for the vaccination of the livestock. But until recently, no one considered the wildlife reservoirs of the disease. Yeah? And uh, principally presence of the presence of the PPR in the wildlife populations can really significantly impact on the, on the attempts to eradicate the disease in the domestic carnivores and uh, sorry, in domestic herbivores and shows, again, now I'm repeating that how connected or interconnected these two fields are. And us as a veterinarian, we have perfect chance and this is for me fascinating to, to act on both sides. And this is in my opinion, the opportunity for the wildlife veterinarians or the wildlife health managers in the near future to really act under that one health paradigm and to look at the diseases from both perspectives or all three perspectives, domestic animals, wildlife, and, uh, and the humans and human health. Fine, if you don't mind, I'll skip parts of that. I don't, gonna to, I'm not gonna to speak about avian malaria in Hawaii because you can easily uh, study it on the internet and or you probably know about that. I will stop a little bit because the time is running too fast. I will stop a little bit on the topic that I mentioned and it's angiostrongylus cantonensis because it shows the same as avian malaria. Angiostrongylus cantonensis is a, is a pathogen as I mentioned in the beginning, which normally 
affects the rats and circulates through the mollusks, which is fine. One can say, okay, so why to care? There is enough rats and there is enough mollusks. That's true. But both the rats and the mollusks belong to the most invasive species in the world. And principally new and new ecosystems are gradually being invaded by the dominant red species, like the, the, there are three of them, Norvegicus, Ratus ratus, and Ratus exulans, but also by the range of invasive, invasive mollusks, like the African giant snails, uh, Hatina fulica, or Caribbean slugs, Veronica lacubensis, and some other. And together with them, these hosts are bringing the Angiostrom glus cantonensis to new and new locations, establishing immediately the life cycle and principally colonizing the whole, whole spectrum of the vertebrates. And what's important, Angiostrom glus cantonensis is through paratonic hosts, transmissible to a range of different mammalian hosts, including humans, including dogs, for example, in Australia and in Asia and so on, and causing severe meningitis in them. So it can be deadly disease. It can be a disease which kills you after, after, for example, you eat the salad contaminated by infected snail. And this is what's really happening. And so this is how the worm look like. And what's interesting that very recent, relatively recently, the Canary Islands were invaded, uh, where the first focus of Angiostrongulus cantonensis was uh, described on, on the island of Tenerife in the northwest part of Tenerife. Nowadays, we know that Angiostrongulus is distributed all along this forested part of the higher altitudes of northern Tenerife in the populations of the mollusks and the indirects. So it's already knock it was already knocking the door of European territory. And very recently, in 2019, the infection was uh, published on the island of Mallorca in Mediterranean. So it's already here. So this is what honestly was expectable and it really came. So we have Angiostrongulus in, uh, in, the, in, in Europe already. And what's interesting, I don't have a slide for here, that on Mallorca, it was not detected in the rats, even though the rat is the dominant host. It was not detected in the snails, but it was detected as a cause for the mortality in North African hedgehogs, Atelarix algirus, which is exactly what's happening in many places of the world. The ecosystem is invaded by the rats and snails, but once other hosts are confronted or are becoming in contact with the pathogen, they develop the pathologies, and finally, the worm can have impact on their populations. This happen, is happening in, to some wildlife in Australia. This is happening to some wildlife in Polynesia. This is happening in other parts of the world. Yeah. And you at Sardinia are kind of already not that far. And to be honest, we don't know. We don't have idea how many Mediterranean islands are already invaded. So it's really a good reason for research targeting the helmets of, of uh, invasive red species, I mean Ratus ratus and Ratus norvegicus, all around the Mediterranean. So it's not only Hawaii and malaria. Yeah, we have the same here, just in front of us. And this is zoonosis. Yeah, so it's, it's easy. Oh, sorry, it's easy. It's not easy, it's interesting. And probably last, last parasite, because it also relates to Italy that I want to mention is Fasciloides magna. It's a probably a flu that you heard about, specifically if you are Italians, and it's something which nicely connects my country, which means the Czechia, Czech Republic, and the Italy, because this parasite invaded Europe twice. Once it happened in Italy, and in the roughly same time it happened also in the Czech Republic. So what is Fasciloides magna? Sorry, I have again the typo because I finished the lecture just a couple of hours ago. So it should be Fasciloides, of course. I hope I have it correct in the next slide. So it's a huge fluke of the family Fasciolidae related relatively closely to Fasciola hepatica, the parasite that you know quite well. It's emerging pathogen in Europe, affecting different species of the, of the deer. And it has also a range of other hosts among the herbivores, but the deer are dominant. This is how the infection look like. So it's a parasite affecting the liver, 
forming huge cysts on the liver. The fluke itself, it's like five, seven centimeters long. So it's really a massive parasite. If you do a necropsy and if you find them, it's something like really wow, well, it's, it's really massive. And the resulting changes can be quite severe, specifically in some species of the deer. So this is the distribution in the United States, where it is primarily associated with white-tailed deers, but can infect also a range of other deer species like wapiti or caribou and so on. And what's important, it invaded European territory in the 19th century, being brought together with the white-tailed deer from United States, and it formed two foci. One is in Italy, other is in Central Europe. What's interesting that the oldest localities in Central Europe probably have a single origin from, uh, from the original area of distribution in the Czech Republic, which was just in the heart of the Czech Republic, south of, south of Prague. And then along the river systems connected to the principle, this is the flow of the Danube River. Somehow, somewhere here, the infection spread further. There is nice molecular, molecular support for this from my uh, many Slovak colleagues that study that, showing that the European lineages are two. The Italian focus originates, sorry, the, the Central European focus originates from the southern part of the United States, from, from the areas of, as you, as you see here, Minnesota, Mississippi, and so on. So from this region, while the Italian focus have different origin, originating from, from here, from, from the areas in, uh, uh, in uh, Alberta and Oregon, I think, from somewhere from here. Which is nice example, nice example showing that a relatively simple molecular tools, in this case, it's a COX-1 phylogeny, uh, can help to understand the, or to track the, the principles of the, the history of biological invasions. Yeah. And now how it relates to Italy. Interestingly, even though this is North American parasite, this invasive fluke was first described by Basse in 1875 in Parco La Mandria. Uh, based on the extensive winter mortality, it was published in Il Medico Veterinario in the 1875. And since that time, this is the area. I've never been there, so I was just recently checking the internet. It looks quite nice. I should go there, definitely. And uh, the infection is present in there. But because it's a game enclosure, which is permanently fenced, it seems, at least what I, without what I saw in recent publications, that more or less the parasite remain inside in the Italy. So it's not spreading, which is big contrast to the, to the foci, uh, focus in the Central European focus and its extension towards the north northeast where we already have it in the free-ranging populations fully. Yeah, like in past decade, the infection together with the deer crossed the borderline to Germany is well established on the massive, uh, mountain massifs all across the Central, Central Europe in the population of red deer, which is principally the areas, our areas are overpopulated with the red deer, which contributes to that. Yeah. And what's interesting from the veterinary point of view, it shows different pathogenicity. So what we see in Europe, that after, after invasion to European territory, the infection easily found a new, new reservoir host, which is a European red deer. The, the pathogen found a new intermediate host, which is a broadly distributed Galba truncatula in Europe, the same host as for Fasciola hepatica. So this is the major cycle. And then occasionally the infection spill over to other species like the fallow deers, which commonly die as a result of massive infections. In the red deer, we don't see the mortalities, or at least I never heard about the deer really dying because of fasciloides. But I saw tens of the fallow deer and sika deer that died because of, uh, because of the infection. And occasionally it can spill over to livestock. However, it's typical, typical parasite of the cervix. So it doesn't go that much to cattle or sheep on that. I'll skip squirrels because we do not have time. I'll skip even this. And I wanted to go to the very, very end. Sorry for that. I was too optimistic. And first at the very end or almost end, one take home message. If we speak about the conservation medicine, 
and which really it's big contrast to the fields like exotic medicine or zoo medicine and so on. The conservation medicine, it's not only about the individuals. So as, as veterinarians, we cannot care only about saving the lives of the individuals or the, some groups of animals. But conservation medicine is basically about the species survival, which really creates nice opportunity for the veterinarians to act more actively. And uh, it offers also a range of the new research opportunities. And it offers also a range of the new jobs, to be honest. Yeah, so for the wildlife experts, this is one of the areas which emerging diseases and impact on the wildlife. It's something that really has future. And just this lecture can sound quite pessimistic. And always after finishing that, I have kind of pessimistic feeling. But I show you at least two examples uh, in which I try to answer the question, if we can change the disease epidemiology in wildlife, if we really will work with the wildlife, can we do something for that? For part of this question, for the question, uh, the first answer I already brought in, in, in case of rabies, I just hear a little bit more details. Yes, we can, we can do things. And one case is rabies in the Ethiopian wolves. You probably know that Ethiopian wolf is one of the rarest large carnivores on the planet. It lives mainly in the Bala Mountains in Ethiopia, where the conservation project is taking place like for decades. And what's interesting here is how the infections have impact. This is from two, two studies. How the infections impact on the population. And you see that always, this is the hit by canine distemper 2005, drop down in the population density. Another, another hit by another wave of distemper five years later, another sudden decrease. Yeah? The same we see rabies. It goes a bit more frequently, the waves of the rabies epidemics. And of course, one can say, okay, this is normal. The carnivores always suffered from the diseases. Of course they did. But this is the population at the edge of extinction. And any further stressor which we are adding to the system is increasing the chance of, of the real extinction of such a, uh, uh, such a species. So in other words, the strong population of a species can react natural way to the pathogen. But when we have the population at the uh, extinction edge, uh, the, even a single epidemics or series of epidemics can really uh, decrease the population too much. And the answer is, in this case, the vaccination and the oral vaccination project that already started in, uh, uh, in Ethiopian mountains being led by international research team. And this gives significant support to the, to the conservation of these carnivores. It cannot save them as such, but it can support their populations to grow to the level when they are really sustainable. And the second even more complex case, and this is the last one, so give me please three more minutes before we start the discussion, is a case of black-footed ferrets in the United States. I'm sure you heard at least something about that but it's nicely connected to the diseases. Black-footed ferret, in Latin, Mustela nigritas, it's small carnivore, which used to be very, very common all across the United States. And it's a food specialist hunting the prairie dogs. I hope you know what's prairie dog. Prairie dog is this, rabbi, this, this rodent. And it's quite a huge species of terrestrial, you can say squirrel in a little bit of simplification in the grasslands of North America. And, and the blue-footed ferret is a special uh, predator specialized on them. They hunt them in the burrows and so on and so on. But what happened in the US that the populations of the prairie dogs dropped down significantly because of mainly the agricultural activities and together with them, also the population of black-footed ferrets got almost extinct. In fact, it was declared extinct in 1974. And then soon, few, I think it was a few years later, accidentally they discovered in Wyoming and only 18 of these animals were captured and the, the successful captive breeding program started with the reintroduction to the uh, to the wild nature. But unfortunately, in several places uh, across their original range, 
they face the situation that there is not enough food. There are no prairie dogs in the area. And those are not only the black-footed black -footed ferrets that depend on the prairie dogs, but also the owls and other species. And what's interesting, what's the reason for the, for the absence of these large herbivores or large rodents in many areas? It's not because they are hunted, they are protected. It's not because of agriculture, they live in the, in the national parks, but it's because of a pathogen, because the populations of the prairie dogs are just being decimated by a plague, by Yersinia, Yersinia pestis, which was introduced uh, by humans to the, uh, to the area. Yeah, so it's principally an emerging disease, which has cascade effect on the population of black-footed ferrets. Yeah? Here you see the fluctuation of the, of the colony or population of the prairie dogs because of the sylvatic plague. And you see, and then imagine that you have a population of a carnivore that depends on that. So there is plenty of prairie dogs and then two years later, almost nothing. And then again, the population is growing and down almost to zero. And if you have a predator, which is endangered anyway, it can easily get extinct in any of these situations because there is nothing to eat. And as a result, of course, the, just to complete the picture, Yersinia is transmitted by the fleas. This is something you definitely know. And as a result, the American or US researchers came, at least with the experimental approach, but I mean the field experimental project, trying to impact the, the plague uh, in the population of the prairie dogs two ways, by the vaccination of the prairie dogs and by decreasing the population of the fleas. So principally, and this is the answer, can we change? Yes, locally we can, we have tools. We can treat, treat the animals against the fleas, which means we remove the dominant vector of the Yersinia. We can vaccinate the animals, which support their immunity and change positively the transmission cycle of the plague in the population. And as a result, the locality with stronger population of the, of the prairie dogs can support or sustain stronger viable population of black-footed ferrets. So as a model, it's nice. Of course, question is if we can do this broadly. Yeah, probably not. So probably a lot of species that are threatened by the emerging diseases will remain threatened or might not extinct even. So the major thing that we can do is the prevention of these diseases. Yeah. Trying, and it's, it's about the exotic animals, it's about the pet animals, it's about the movement of the animals. So we should do our best to prevent, prevent the uh, invasion or introduction of a new pathogens or new host with the pathogens into new natural ecosystems or the systems. And I think that's it. So I will end with the lyrics of, of Queen, which perfectly, perfectly describes the situation in uh, which we are living now. Oof, done. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Many thanks, David, for a very nice conversation. And uh, there are, uh, I think, some questions from, uh, from the classroom. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Go ahead, Federica. OK. Hi. Hi. So I have a question regarding the intranuclear coccidiosis oh. in uh, in tortoise. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the best uh, the best way the best method to detect this disinfection, and uh, what we um, what do we know about the causative agent of the mm -hmm. intra intranuclear coccidiosis? Thank you for these questions because I can answer that. Because together with my colleagues, principally year, two years ago, we described full life cycle of the pathogen. So we already know that uh, the cause is monoxenos coccidium, which is distantly related to Imeria. But in diagnostics, the problem is that they are just six micrometers big. So they are, by the normal microscopy, almost do not see them. So this is why they were overlooked so far in the feces. So yes, you can detect them by the microscopy in the fecal samples, but it's difficult. 
or you can detect them by PCR, either in the fecal samples or in the organs of that tortoises. And of course, if you have fresh carcasses, you can detect them also by uh, histology. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other question? Yes, hey one, David is speaking. First of all, I will say thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. My pleasure. Uh, my question is, I live near uh, Natural Park La Mandria and I know very well the problem of mm -hmm. Pachyloides magna. And I, th I, I ask you, what is your opinion if the, this parasite uh, uh, in the future would like to, to spread out of the park in, for the red deer? Look, uh, once it gets beyond the fences, you cannot stop it. Yeah? This is exactly what happened in the Czech Republic. So you can all, only observe what's happening. So if, if, it sh if there is a way to, to eradicate that, in my opinion, probably the only way war is to, er to eradicate all the hosts from the, from the area. And after several years to repopulate the population of the deer in the, in the park which is probably not acceptable for the, for the managers, the owners and the public, but this is the only way. Once it really crosses the borders, if it finds the continuous population of the red deer, it will go very fast. The only good thing is that normally it do not cycle through the road deer. I don't know how is the situation outside the park in your area with the, with the herbivores. But like in the Czech Republic, it normally doesn't go to road deer population, or at least the road deers cannot sustain the parasite life cycle permanently. Yeah, so, but unfortunately, the Czech Republic is really densely populated by the red deer, which is really perfect host. So, but I don't know, is it still in the fenced area or there are already the cases outside in your region? I, I don't know, but th there's a, a wall that yeah. It is all, of... all around the park, but I think that uh, one deer can surpass the, this wall because it's not very continuous. And, and but and I don't I... know if the the parasite is is yet uh, in the red deer out of the park. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Also, yeah. Question is how dense is the population of the red deer outside the park? Of course, also. Yeah. So yeah, but the risk is obvious. And when it, re when it reaches the Alps, for example, the red, the red deer population in the Alps, you cannot, cannot change it at all. So if the focus in Italy is still very limited, it would be quite interesting project really to try to think really prospectively and try to protect really the population of the red deer from this, from this parasite because the example of Central Europe is obvious. One, it's get wild, it's wild, and it spreads very fast, indicates it can, like it's in my own life. When we started to study fasciolides like 30 years ago, or 25, 20, it was, it had really a restricted distribution in the Czech Republic. Nowadays, it's everywhere from Poland through Germany to Austria, Slovakia, and so on. So it's already almost one focus connected by the mobile red deer population and associated with overpopulation by the red deer. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, I would like to have your opinion about the situation in, Aust in Australia. I don't know if you have heard there have been, uh, it's happened an invasion of rats in Australia. Australia. So, and I have read uh, some newspapers regarding a uh, plague. Uh, so, I don't I have one just your prevention measurement in this case. It's a difficult question, yeah. So, if if I have the answer, they'll probably pay me well, the Australians. No, <laughs> the, the waves of the like the population dynamics or the populations of the of the rats are always very dynamic, and it's typical for the Australian ecosystems for past. 200 years, that they are the waves of the rodents, depending on the climate, depending also on the diseases and so on. So, and always the population goes up and after it goes down, it's an ecology. So it's not that, for me, it's not that surprising. Now it looks kind of really 
stressing or something alarming if you see it in the news. But if you look to the history in Australia, it was common in the past as well. Of course, for the period of time, it can greatly change the dynamics of the diseases. But in such situation, I would expect only the diseases with the direct life cycle, yeah, which are the viruses or the bacteria, leptospira, and so on. Because the, the, the parasite like Angiostrongylus depends on the full life cycle, it needs to infect the snails, then it should develop in the snails, infect other rats, and so on. And Angiostrongylus in Australia is anyway distributed only alongside the eastern shore because it's humid enough to sustain the population of the snails. So I, in, in the infections that I know, I don't expect that the short term overpopulation by the rats can have significant impact. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Yes, uh, sorry. No, sorry. Do you want, Francesca, do you want to? No, no, it's okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for your uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, about the Virunga gorillas, um, I didn't get the point. I mean, um, do we have to uh, avoid the, the um, to interfere with their environment? Uh, no, no, it was not about the environment. It was about that we should think carefully about the sustainability of the growing population in the limited environment, yeah, which is a common project in many conservation programs. This is the dark side of the conservation. At the beginning, you don't have enough animals. It's the same in the zoos, honestly. At the beginning, you don't have enough animals. So you start really significantly protecting them or managing them. And at the end, sooner or later, you reach the opposite side when you have too many animals and you don't have more space. And this is unfortunately the problem of the current nature or the wildlife conservation over days. So we have enough animals, but we don't have enough space. Okay. Yeah? And this is what's happening in Virunga with high probability. And if it is not happening now, it will anyway happen soon. Because thanks to the veterinary management and all the regulations, the population is steadily growing. And sooner or later, nobody knows when, but sooner or later it should reach the upper, upper limit of, this, of, of, the, of the ecosystem. And we don't have the tools yet. We even don't have the ideas how to do that later on. Yeah? Because imagine that you are an organization that is strictly preserving or protecting the gorillas for 50 years, let's yes. say. And then you are reaching the situation when you have too many of them and you have to totally change your attitude and you have to start thinking about the, how to regulate the population of mountain gorillas, which is ethically unacceptable for most of your donors. Yeah, because as a nature conservationist, you live from the donors and the donors are paying you for protecting the animals. So every year you celebrate, every year you celebrate another 10 gorillas, another 15 gorillas, perfect, nice, population is growing and then Boom, and you have to come with totally different, different uh, concept. And we don't have it for the mountain gorillas, I have to say. I'm parasitologist, so I, might, I can say, okay, I don't care guys, these are your gorillas. But it, it worries me because we have no idea how to deal with that because there are not that many, that many options. Principally, there are only two, three. There are three options. Mm -hmm. Either we do zero interference and then we will just observe them dying because okay. of the infections or we start the management like the way that we do the deworming, but then it's even making the situation worse because the population will grow further. Or we can start thinking how to, how to limit the population. You probably cannot kill them directly because even for me, it's not acceptable starting shooting gorillas. It's something no one can imagine. It will create probably the international war. Yes. But what, what other tools you have, you, can, you have the tool of contraception. But then it's really totally, absolutely losing the status of the wild animals. Just imagine that you as a wildlife manager will imply the contraception to the groups. Yeah? And then it's a farm. This is what I said, it's a farm. So it's kind of, for me, it's a set, but it really shows. And it's for me, this is something also which includes, which can be included into one health yeah, that we really need for the conservation of the animals. We really need holistic approaches. 
It's not about the veterinarians. As veterinarians, we can treat the gorilla easily. You take the immobilizing gun, you fill it with moxidectin, and you can shoot as many as you, you are able to shoot, and they are deformed. But this is not the solution. Uh, so that's kind of for you guys that are coming for the new generation. It's really opportunity, but in the same time, it's an enormous challenge. Yes. Yeah, so it's fascinating. We are, we are still on the way to decide what to do in this um, in these situations. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I understand. Francesca. Hi, thank you for the lesson. And you said before that uh, Anthrostrangerus campanensis might be present in, uh, in this territory as mm -hmm. well. I'm from Sardinia. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what can we do in order to find it if check on rats or mm -hmm. check on mollusks? No, rats, rats are the easiest way. Yeah, it's a parasite of lungs and heart or lung, lung blood vessels and the heart. And it's very easy to find in the necropsies. I even have a manual that we did together with the, with the colleagues in Indonesia because we do monitoring in Indonesia and Caribbean and so on. So you need to catch the rats in the localities that can be suspicious because of maybe history or something, maybe close to the ports because it's, the rats are entering with the boats. So the parasite is entering together with them. So if there are huge populations of the rats living in the somehow natural environment close to the major ports or something, collecting the rats, examining them, necropsies, very fast necropsy, you open lungs, open heart, you see positive, negative, it goes very fast. This is in my opinion the easiest because once you start detecting it in mollusks, it's complicated because you start, you need to distinguish the different larvae of the metastrongulates, it's not so easy. Yeah, you can see the allerostrongulus, you can see angiostrongulus vasorum and so on, so it's complicated. And by the molecular tools, in my opinion, it's not necessary. It, it's still complicated. If I can compare doing the PCR and doing single necro necropsy within five minutes, I would probably prefer the necropsy in case of invasive animals like the rats. Yeah, so I would okay. suggest collecting and so on. We can talk later. We have we have a kind of guideline how to how to do so. It's very easy and okay. it can be quite interesting research. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other question? Um, I have another question. Yes, sure. Um, is there a sort of limit in spreading of pathogens in the poles? Uh, I mean, since there are very low temperatures. Yeah, of course. But it depends which pathogens it is, uh, of course. But of course there is. The diversity of pathogens is quite low. And this is why the animals which are coming from the north or from the south are very sensitive for the, to the pathogens. The nice examples are penguins, for example. Penguins principally cannot survive the avian malaria because naturally they are not facing this infection. So penguins in the European zoological gardens are commonly dying, and I had a student working on that in the past two years, commonly dying because of malaria that they are getting through mosquitoes from the common birds. Yeah. Now, other other example, other this is from the south. If you go to the north, other nice example is the snowy owl, that white owl from Harry Potter. Again, extremely sensitive to hemoparasites because it's coming from the environment where the parasites are. Yeah, also. they are not used to these pathogens. You mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Other question? I have a, a one question from Facebook, and uh, he is a, a friend of us because he is Harold Salam from uh, Israel, works mm -hmm. with uh, Gad Bannett, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and ask um, if it is true that parasite can be a major cause of mortality in wildlife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's very general. Uh... Also questioning what is the parasite? So the in general, no, 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 probably I cannot answer this. Yes and no. There are many examples that they can be. Even the parasite, the question is what the parasites are, what we mean by the word parasite. Yeah, of course, the viruses are more, the viruses are more dangerous because they commonly have direct life cycle and higher rate of the replication. 
But at least some of the parasites I spoke about, like the Angiostrongylus, avian malaria in Hawaii, even Fasciloides and so on, they can have impact and they can lead to the extinction of some hosts. Like if we go to the fungal infections, Chytridiomycosis, it's a fungal disease of amphibians, which led to the extinction of dozens of amphibian species in the tropics. Yeah, so they can, they can definitely, they can. Perfect. And uh, so some greetings from uh, Facebook. There is also Ali Reza Sazman oh, from, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> from Iran. And, uh, nice. and Choma from uh, Bari. I think, uh, Gael, do you want to make a question? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. It was so interesting. Uh, I was wondering regarding angiostrongylus, whether if we do a res retrospective study about a human meningitis of non-bacterial origin, would it be an indirect uh -huh. way to identify whether the country is endemic for the parasite or not? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, perfect question, but difficult to answer. First of all, it depends which material you have, yeah? because like in most of the cases, you can detect the angiostrongulus infection in human patients by the sensitive PCR or qPCR from the cerebrospinal fluid. So theoretically, if you have CSF from those patients, and now this uh, team from NIH in Washington, we developed really sensitive qPCR approach. So yes, we can. Yeah, so, but if you don't have material from those patients, then it's very difficult because clinically it's very non-specific. It's just eosinophilic meningitis. Okay. So maybe, maybe also the, the humans, sorry, I just finished. The humans are just a kind of peak of the iceberg. Yeah. So it's like, I don't think that the humans are good sentinels for monitoring the infection. Uh, okay. Uh, you, you think maybe if we search in the pathology laboratories for the causes of the common causes of meningitis, maybe this can also help us in detecting whether. Uh, Theoretically, specifically, if you see there, if you see there the, the worms, like if you really have the histologies and you see the worms, but still, even then, it's a question if this is really angiostrongulus. Uh, so it's, but. Theoretically, yes, but I, I would say the, the red approach is probably the fastest and easiest because in most of the areas which are invaded by angiostrongulus, the prevalence in rats is higher than 20, 30%. In other words, if you catch 200 rats, it's probably enough to say if it is present or absent in the given, I mean, 200 rats from a one locality, then you can say it's absent or it's present. Okay, thank you so much. I thank you for your question. It was really interesting. And we really work with Angiostrongulus. So if you have any questions or ideas, let's share it and we can, can think about Actually, it. Actually, I'm, I'm from Lebanon and it's also a Mediterranean country where we, we, we lack data about it. So it would be probably an interesting topic to tackle. Yeah. yeah. Question is the, in Lebanon itself, question might be the humidity in the, of the environment. Yeah, because in most of the cases, angiostrongulus, it's more like in the humid places. But on the other hand, nowadays we know that it's present in Mallorca, which is also not an area with extreme humidity. So if it can make it in Mallorca, maybe more some humid places in uh, Lebanon can be good. So don't hesitate to ask any time. I can share you with our papers or the methodologies. And that's definitely interesting. Thank you so much. Of course, I will. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I, I have more questions from Facebook. There is uh, Choma Aneke, uh, which is a PhD student of uh, our friend Domenico Otranto. Mm -hmm. Let us ask, have you checked the resistance uh, of these uh, wildlife strains uh, to some uh, parasite drugs? Which uh, it's very, very general, <laughs> very general question, to, to be honest. But uh, there is no reason to think that they are not, that they are resistant that much. Yeah? Because like, if you mean the anthelmintic resistance, I don't expect that because it really, I don't expect that to be honest. Yet, yeah. not yet. She, she clarified that, uh, she means that if there are any reports of uh, drug resistance in wild animals, in wildlife uh, species. Not, not what I know. And I'm not surprised that they are not because as I said, like the, 
the principle, the way the wildlife is living, it's kind of against the appearance of the resistance. Yeah, because, yeah. But I can, on the other hand, I can easily imagine if you have a fenced animals like the deer or zoo animals, and if you massively and long time apply the anthelmintics, I'm almost sure that the resistance will appear, but you need to have close herd. Yeah. Um, um, another question from Facebook is, um, if, uh, mm, what about the serology? And uh, if uh, maybe um, you, we can do something uh, like uh, is already done for Angiostrongerus basorum, uh, like, uh, um, so a serology test for screening population of uh, animals or not? Do you think uh, it's possible? Theoretically, yes. And probably then the dogs are the best sentinel. Because in Australia, it was proven repeatedly because they have high level of the dog medicine. It's a team in Sydney working on that. So they proved that the dogs are sensitive, of course, and they are relatively easy to approach and you can collect the material from them. Yeah, but I'm not really expert in the serology. So I cannot comment on the details, but that's possible. Question is, and I'm not really sure if it is possible or not to distinguish the antibodies to Vazorum from antibodies of cantonenses. It can be tricky. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't know if there are any other questions from, uh, from the classroom. No, but they ask you a lot of things. No, I, and, uh, so. I think that they are very happy and uh, myself too. And uh, if you want, uh, we will be pleased to have you as a guest next month. If you come in Italy. Thank you very time. much. And you, you can do a, we can do a, a live with uh, Domenico too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I hope to invite you by person here in Sardinia when uh, we emerge. And I really wish to see you all and definitely we find a way how to do something together. And if you feel that the rats are interesting, let's really do something because those are not only the angiostrongulus, but in the same time, other pathogens can be monitored like leptospira and waterborne diseases and so on. So the rats are interesting model. And usually you don't need to do much paperwork for the research uh, because they are invasive yeah. species and the pets. Yeah, Francesca is working on red foxes and uh, also on, on angiostrongulus. Mm -hmm. And maybe a future development it could be also to, to yeah. work a little bit on uh, rats. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. And uh, see you soon. Okay. Yeah. So ciao, tutti, and see you soon. Have a nice afternoon. Ciao. Bye, ciao, bye. Ciao. bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.